When we uh, lived in Montreal, I always took visitors on a tour of St. Joseph's Oratory. Those of you who uh, visited Montreal when Lise and I were there know that, right, PJ? As long as I lived in Montreal, I was the designated tour guide for St. Joseph's Oratory, a huge basilica, largest, the second largest basilica in the world, second largest only to St. Peter's in Rome, stood on a high hill. You had to take, to, to, on the ground floor, you had to take a series, I think it was a series of three escalators to get up to the main auditorium. They had the little auditorium at the bottom. The little auditorium would hold a thousand people. That was the little auditorium. The big auditorium at the top held 10,000 people. From the floor to the ceiling, this is after you'd taken three escalators to get to the top floor, to get into the main, you know, the main basilica part, from the floor to the ceiling, was seven stories from the floor to the ceiling. The organ that they had in there, you know, the, the piano, the organ that they had in there was so big, it would not fit into this auditorium. You couldn't get the organ into this auditorium. That's how huge it was. Now, St. Joseph's Oratory was a shrine, and it was a shrine built in honor of a Quebec saint through whom the Roman Catholic Church claimed miracles were done. And those of you who visited, when we go through a certain part of the basilica, you would see all the crutches and canes and stuff like that uh, from individuals who uh, claimed that they had been healed at that place because of their prayers to um, uh, their prayers to St. Joseph and through the intermediary of Brother Andre. Brother Andre was like a deacon in the church at the time, a real person. He lived at the turn of the 20th century and people claimed that they were healed because he poured oil on them and he prayed for them and so on and so forth. My point here is that the difference between a church and a shrine, because in Montreal there are 300 you know, Catholic dioceses and church buildings and things like that. Not all of them are shrines. A shrine is a place where miracles are supposed to have taken place. So St. Joseph's Oratory was a shrine. The province of Quebec is full of shrines where miracles were supposed to have happened, healings, visions of Jesus, but actually more visions of Mary than visions of Jesus. So often as I took people around on a tour, um, uh, people would ask me, you know, did these things really happen? So often when I studied with someone, especially someone who grew up in Catholic Quebec, they would ask me, do miracles still happen today? Because they grew up in that environment. I grew up in that environment, you know, having been raised in Catholic Quebec. My answer was always the same. Never mind what your church leader says, what does the Bible teach? Never mind what your church leader says, what does the Bible teach? If it teaches that there are miracles today, boy, let's expect miracles, let's look for them, let's pray for them. And if the Bible teaches that there are no miracles today, then we can confidently reject the claims of modern miracles. And so I want to talk about miracles tonight. Before I start with miracles, I want to talk about the difference between miracles and magic. Magic is a word that comes from magi. These were the priests who practiced this art in ancient Persia. The dictionary defines magic as the art which claims to control and manipulate the secret forces of nature by occult, secret, and ritualistic methods. Webster's Dictionary of Magic. Now there are two kinds of magic, personal magic and impersonal magic. Let me get my notes straightened here. 
Impersonal magic, this kind of magic assumes that there are secret forces at work in the world and by manipulation through drugs or incantations, rituals, these forces can be made to act in a certain way. For example, I have my lucky medal, whatever. I have my lucky medal and by wearing my lucky medal, negative forces will be rejected and positive forces will be drawn to me. Positive forces, we have a word for that, and that word is luck. Luck. Whenever I hear a Christian say to me, good luck, I always stop them there and say, no, 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 no. Don't wish magic on me, because that's what luck is, magic. Don't say, we were so lucky. Don't say that if you're a Christian. Don't say, boy, well, with a little luck, you know, we'll have a lot of people come to church this morning. No, 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 no. Don't say that. Something good happens to you, brother and sister. What's it called? It's called a blessing. It's not called luck. Take that word out of your vocabulary. Use it only in the way I'm using it. I'm using it here. Luck is just an idea of impersonal magic. Then the other type of magic is personal magic. This magic tries to control living, intelligent, spiritual beings through rituals, incantations, or have an individual become a kind of a medium through which the power can be used. So basically magic all magic, all kinds, and there's hundreds and hundreds of different forms of it, but basically it's always the same. It's the belief that there's some sort of power that exists in the other world, spiritual world, dark world, occult world, whatever you want to call it. That there are certain powers out there, spirits, and that somehow here in the material world you can manipulate those powers to work for you or to work against somebody else. What's the most famous thing that we know about where we get the forces of magic to work against somebody else? You take a what kind of doll? You take a voodoo doll and you stick pins in it, right? We know that. But what's behind that? Well, what's behind that is we're somehow trying to draw the power from the outer world, the spiritual world, and we're trying to manipulate it through this doll through this object and somehow shoot it negatively towards someone who is our enemy. Sometimes we're looking for a person who can be the, the medium of that power, the channel of that power. We call that divination, fortune telling, witchcraft, all of that. It's, it, they're just various forms of the very same thing. You know, the, the beef that I've got against the Harry Potter and uh, all these you know, werewolf movies and so on. So I know it's all romance and it's all Hollywood, but it's also an introduction to magic because it's all about, it popularizes magic. And so you know, I'm 65, I'm going to read this and, you know, and I've read a lot of books and I know about stuff and I go, oh yeah, this is what this is. But if you're 12, you might not be able to read and say, oh, this is what this is. I know, I've spoiled it for a lot of you, but what can I tell you? The thing to remember about magic is that it is based on manipulation. It is where man is trying by some method to manipulate a higher power, whether it be nature or the forces of the spirit, the gods, or even God himself, for man's own purpose, whether it be a good purpose or a bad purpose. I want, I want you to realize something. It's not the goal that determines whether it's magic or not. It's the method. Even if you have a good goal, even if your goal is good, that doesn't mean that the thing that you're using is good. If you're trying to use magic to heal somebody, it's still magic. If you're trying to use magic to right the forces of evil, and most of these movies and books, this is the premise. 
We're trying to do something good. We're good vampires. We're good witches. We're good, we're good in all of this. And so because we're trying to achieve a good goal, then our magic is good. Wrong. Wrong. What God calls an abomination is always an abomination, no matter for what purpose you use it. God calls homosexuality an abomination. If you're a homosexual prostitute but you give your money to the poor, it's still an abomination. Magic is still an abomination. We need to remember that, parents. All right, let's talk about miracles. Get a little more upbeat here. Miracles comes from the Latin word to wonder, the Greek word for a sign. The dictionary defines miracle as a supernatural event regarded or due to divine action. Whereas magic tries to manipulate the forces in nature to produce an effect, miracles are produced with higher laws than nature when those are put into play. For example, in Exodus 14 verses 21 and 22, Moses divides the Red Sea. The natural laws of gravity are suspended by a higher law, a higher power. You could almost say that magic comes from below and tries to affect what is above. And miracles come from above and they affect what is below. With miracles, um, natural forces are not merely manipulated, they're completely set aside. You know, there is no manipulation of the water. The natural forces of gravity and so on and so forth were completely set aside when the sea parted to allow the people to go through. Now let's talk about miracles in the Bible, shall we? There are different types of miracles. There are miracles that come directly from God without any intermediary. The creation of the world, for example, is a miracle. Why? Because God did it without any help from man, no intermediary. He spoke creation into being. That's a miracle because nothing comes from nothing and yet God spoke it into being. The resurrection of Jesus, for example, no, no human intermediary. It's one thing you're very sick and you get better. It's quite another thing that you're beaten to death and then you're dead in the grave for three days and then you're brought back to life. That's a miracle. Then there are miracles that are indirectly from God, perhaps using man as an intermediary. Moses, for example, and the plagues, the prophets who spoke of the future, the apostles and the gifts that they had, the miracles that they performed. So we need to recognize that God set natural laws in order so that His creation would function in a precise way. However, this does not mean that He is not active in His creation in a providential way. In other words, providence is when God works within His own established systems. You know, there's a drought and someone prays, God, please send rain. And God marshals the natural forces to send, to send rain. Or someone is critically ill on the verge of dying and prayers go up and God uses the natural functioning of the body to heal itself. The problem that a lot of people have is they confuse God's providential care with miracles. God's providential care is pretty amazing. I mean, it's amazing to see what God does just within the laws that He Himself has created. Worthy of praise, worthy of glory, worthy of honor, His providential care. 
that all animals are fed, that you and I you know, find work, have food, our hearts continue to beat, all of this, God's providential care. But this is not miraculous. But sometimes God breaks through the conventional layer of natural laws in order to accomplish something according to His divine will. We call this a sign or a wonder because it is a sign of His presence and power and it is a wonder to behold. He gives the Israelites water not from the clouds but from a rock. That's a miracle, that he marshals together the forces of his creation to provide water at a specific moment through natural means. Again, that's his providential care and is worthy of thanksgiving. But when God provides water from a rock, now we really have to pay attention. That's a miracle. And so we should always pray that God works because He continues to do amazing things through His providential care. Now, we tend to think sometimes that there are miracles everywhere in the Bible, all the time. It's just one miracle after another, and that's, that's not accurate. It seems that there are many miracles, but when we look at the Bible, we see that miracles are clustered or grouped, like grapes, if you wish, around certain periods of history. For example, Moses and the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt and their time in the desert, 15 centuries before Christ, there is a cluster of miracles around that time. The next main period is during the lifetime of certain prophets, Elijah and Elisha, who lived in the ninth century before Christ. They also were responsible for many, many miracles, even the raising of the dead. And then further down the line, Hezekiah, the king of Judah in the seventh century before Christ. God saved the city through a miraculous sign and also performed other signs for Hezekiah's benefit. And then Daniel the prophet in Babylon, six centuries before Christ, prophecy and dreams and so on and so forth, a cluster of miracles there. And then the one that probably we're the most familiar with, the time of Jesus and the apostles in the first century, the miracles of Jesus and the miracles of the apostles. So there were miracles, of course, before Moses, and there were some miracles on into the second century, just a little bit after the apostles, but the great majority of miracles are grouped around these five historical periods that we read about in the Bible. Now the important thing is why? What are the reasons for the miracles? All these times, all these periods, different times in his, history, different situations, but all of these time periods, we actually see only two reasons for miracles. Number one, to produce faith. Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Hezekiah, all of them saw miracles and were agents of miracles so that the people around them would believe in God. A miracle is a visible sign so strong that it creates belief in something that we do not see. In Deuteronomy, I believe, chapter four, if you have your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter four, in verse 32, it says the following, indeed, Ask now concerning the former days which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth and inquire from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything been done like this great thing or has anything been heard like it? Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard it and survived? Or has a God tried to go and take for Himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by an outstretched arm, and by a great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, He is God. There is no other besides Him. Miracles point to God. 
There can be no doubt that something greater than yourself, what we call God, is the one who is responsible for miracles because they are beyond the natural. The second reason for miracle is to, miracles is to confirm truth. You know, when Jesus spoke of who He really was, He used miracles to confirm the fact that, that He was telling the truth. In John chapter 20, go to John chapter 20, shall we? In John chapter 20, <clears throat> verse 30 and 31, there, 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 this idea runs through the whole New Testament, but John summarizes it here very neatly for us. It says, therefore many other signs, there's that word signs, miracles, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. When the apostles were sent off to preach the gospel, Jesus promised that they would have the power to do miracles in order to confirm that what they were saying was true. I believe that Marty read that passage for us this morning in Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went out and preached every, uh, everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. Listen, what was they doing? And the Lord confirmed the word with the signs that followed. What was the purpose of the signs? To confirm the word. So in all of history, great miracles have been done in order to reveal the presence of God and to confirm His authentic prophets. Miracles were not always uh, used to do this. Sometimes at critical moments, God worked miracles to save His nation or His prophets. You know, Daniel in the lion's den and Hezekiah in Jerusalem. But always these miracles would affect others and their faith. And always these miracles would confirm that what God said through His prophets and servants was indeed true. So here's the question. Do we have miracles today? The answer, no, no. There are three major positions, really. First position held by a Roman Catholic Church is that miracles continue but they are sporadic. They have continued sporadically throughout history, meaning even to this day every once in a while there's a miracle, that's the official Roman Catholic position. The other position, the second position held by many different Protestant, charismatic, evangelical groups is that miracles have never ceased. They have continued throughout history, they are present today, there are people today who can do miracles of healing and knowledge and so on and so forth and they claim this, they continue to pursue it, they demonstrate it publicly, they are all for miracles today. And of course in our brotherhood, in the churches of Christ, we believe and we teach that according to the Bible, we believe that miracles ceased with the uh, age of the apostles. Now, why do we believe, it's not my job to explain Catholic theology and it's not my job to explain what they believe next door, but I think I ought to be able to explain what we believe to our own uh, brothers and sisters. So why? Why do we say no? Three main reasons. Number one, because God has perfectly revealed Himself to man through Jesus Christ. No miracle today could more perfectly release, uh, reveal God to us than God made flesh in Jesus. How could there be a better miracle than that? Let's look in Colossians, shall we? Colossians chapter two. Chapter two, verses nine and 10. Paul says, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete and He is the head over all rule and authority. 
And then in Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter one, verses one to three, it says, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now listen, if the purpose of miracles is to create faith in the existence of God, then the appearance of God in a miracle doing person is a superior proof than a single miracle. I mean you have God in person doing miracles. You can't do better than that. You can't do better than that. God Himself, in form of a man, doing miracles that only God can do. You can't improve on that. 2,000 years later, we can't do better than that. So why no miracles today? Because we have had the best proof to point us to the true and living God in Jesus Christ. Second reason, we believe there are no miracles today because the Bible contains enough information about Jesus and the apostles and their miracles in order to confirm the message. Now you have to keep in mind the two reasons, you know, why, why did God do miracles to begin with? Well, to point to God, A, and B, to confirm the truth. Those are the two reasons for miracles in the Bible. Other people can have reasons for their miracles, but remember what we said at the beginning? At the beginning we were going to say, let's find out what the Bible says about miracles. And the Bible says, well, number one, miracles point to God. Number two, miracles confirm God's word. And so didn't we read in John chapter 20, 30 and 31 where John said, Jesus made many other miracles, but the ones we write about here are written so that you may what? That you may believe. Wait a minute, did He say, and the miracles that will continue on throughout history into the future will be done in order that you may believe? Is that what He said? No. He says the miracles that were done, and a lot of them weren't noted, but we've written these down. Why? So that you can believe. Now ask yourself, if the apostles, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, did not bother to record other miracles by Jesus, and they felt that the miracles that they did record were enough for you to believe, what makes anybody think today that they can do a miracle today to add to what has already been given in the Bible? Do you see my point? The Bible already says, we've written about these miracles and you know what? That's enough to create faith in you. You don't need more than that. I don't need a miracle in 2012 to confirm the truth of Jesus' words because they have already been confirmed by miracles in the first century. They had more than enough miracles. They didn't even record all of them. And then thirdly, no miracles today. The Bible says that the miraculous signs that were done in the early church would end. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, shall we? Verse uh, chapter uh, 13, <clears throat> excuse me, and we begin, I believe, in verse 8. Paul says, love, he's speaking this beautiful passage on love, and he says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, which is a miracle, they will be done away. If there are tongues, which is a miracle, they will cease. If there is knowledge, this also, miraculous knowledge, knowledge inspired directly from God. It will be done away. 
For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say that miracles are going to continue to be a sign. On the contrary, the Bible says that there will be an end to these. And now the power of God will be, uh, will, will use the, uh, excuse me, and now the power that God will use to save men will be the gospel itself, will be the word, will be the recorded miracles, will be the recorded life of Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 16, that the power of God unto salvation is what? Miracles? No. He says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Let me ask you something. If the gospel was the power of God unto salvation in the first century when the apostles were alive, what makes us think that we're going to change that 20 centuries later? If the power to save people was the gospel in the hands of apostles who could do miracles, well certainly it's still the power to save today in the hands of weak and sinful men and women such as ourselves. The power that God now uses to reveal Himself, to confirm the truth, and to save His people is the word of God. So what about the miraculous claims that we hear about? That was always the question. This, this sermon is just a list of questions that people that I've studied with continue to ask. It seems that people read the Bible and they say, yeah, I see that, I understand that. You know, but my uncle, my uncle went to this meeting and somewhere and swears that this guy came in and there was a miracle. Well, the Bible records that many people were able to perform signs and wonders, but not all of these were from God. A sign or a supernatural demonstration is no guarantee that God is at work. In Deuteronomy chapter seven, the magicians at Pharaoh's court could do some, not all, but some of the things. They duplicated some of the things that Moses did. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, some were saying, Lord, Lord, did we not perform miracles in your name? And he said, away, I never knew you. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 and 10, Paul talks about the lawless one who will come, performing signs and wonders. So many people are trying to pass off magic for miracles, using prayers and incantations and holy oil and candles to heal the sick. That's not a miracle, that's, that's magic, that's the occult. Just because they use Jesus' name and it sometimes worked doesn't mean it's from God. Miracles always produce faith in the existence of God and confidence in His word. Today, the Bible perfectly serves this purpose. Someone who doesn't believe the Bible will not believe in Jesus or God anymore if they witness a miracle. Faith in God and Christ that leads to salvation and eternal life comes from Christ's words, not seeing a miracle. Again, the Bible says this, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? Hearing the word of Jesus, the word of the Lord. I mean, they could have said faith comes from miraculous signs or faith comes from signs. Look for the signs, look for the miracles. But over and over again, the Bible continually emphasizes the idea that it's the word that saves, that it's the word that reveals God, that it's the word that is confirmed, not signs. Usually you can spot the fakes because their miracles are usually attached to financial gain of some kind. Send money so this ministry can continue. 
Jesus said the apostles, imagine, Jesus said to the apostles who actually could do miracles that they were to freely give because they had freely received. I go back to my Montreal roots. One of the features in the St. Joseph's Oratory, beautiful building, you know, marvelous architecture, awe-inspiring. You couldn't go more than 30 feet at a time and what was on the wall at every spot that you went? Well, there was a box to put money in. There were candles that you could light that would bring your prayers or at least represent your prayers before this saint or that saint. And what would you have to do to light that candle? Well, you had the small candles for a dollar and you had the bigger candles for five dollars. Every single place that you went, the miraculous was always subsidized by money. Bible records or records miracles throughout history. It does, but it reports them in certain groups at certain times for certain very, very specific purposes. We've learned also that miracles were always done to create faith in God or to confirm the authenticity of the messengers of God. And we've discussed the idea that there are no, the Bible teaches there are no miracles today. Not because can't, God can't do them, but He has something better to work with. His Word. His Word. Much more powerful, much more effective. You know, if miracles were so effective, how come the Jews didn't believe? Because they saw miracles after miracle after miracle. And yet for 2,000 years we haven't had miracles, but we've had the word and millions and millions and millions and millions of people have believed in God and turned their lives over to Jesus Christ. No more miracles. Why? Jesus Christ is the one who reveals God. That was His purpose. When we see Jesus, we see God. John chapter 14, eight and nine. No need for miracles to reveal God. They do not do it as well as Jesus does. Secondly, we know that the Bible is all we need to bring us to faith in Jesus Christ. Paul even says it, 2 Timothy 3.15, from an early age you have known the holy writings, he says, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Again, could have said, look for a sign and it'll make you wise to self, but he didn't. He didn't. From an early age, you have known the holy writings, he says, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. What makes that any different 20 centuries later? 20 centuries later, we encourage you to bring your children to Bible class and, and so on and so on. Why? Because we want them from an early age to know the holy writings that will make them wise unto salvation. And then finally, the Bible says that the signs from God will eventually end in 1 Corinthians. It doesn't say that all signs and wonders will end. There will always be magic and some in the name of Jesus. There will always be false prophets and false wonders in the name of Jesus in order to seduce people into believing what is false. Let's face it, what better way to believe what is false than with a false sign? A miracle is a sign, and all the miracles in the Bible point ultimately to Christ and faith in Him. The Bible does this work in our age and not miracles. So let's be mature, shall we? Shall, let's be mature spiritually and not be swept away by magic posing as miracles or great signs performed even if they're done in Jesus' name. Let's remember that uh, every such thing is a violation of His word and all things done against His word in this world will be rejected by Him when He returns at the beginning of the next age. So there's only one miracle left to do. 
You know, I said there are no more miracles, but actually there's only one miracle left to do, and that is the one that we, uh, that we will all experience when Jesus will come and resurrect us from the dead, those that have loved Him, and those who have been faithful to His word until His coming. I do pray that all of us sitting here tonight will experience that miracle. And we can make sure that we will experience that miracle if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God as is preached in His word. And if according to Acts, again I go back to what Marty was preaching this morning, Acts 2, 37 and 38, those who repent of their sins, those who believe in Christ and are baptized, will receive the forgiveness of sins and the presence of the Holy Spirit within them. You know, we're walking miracles because the Spirit of God dwells in us, waiting for that time when He will resurrect us from the dead to be eternally with Christ in the air when He comes. If you don't have that miracle, if you wish, working in your life, God offers it to you tonight. And so if you have not repented, have not confessed Christ, not been baptized, then we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and sing our song of encouragement.